meeting to order. It uh, is nine o'clock. Um, I guess uh, my clock is a little bit off. Uh, 9.02 on the Ledge TV clock. Uh, just uh, quickly, we're going to start uh, the meetings. Uh, we're going to do all of the presentations first. They've been scheduled in for 15 minutes, 10 minute presentation, five minute Q&A. Uh, we'll start with Bill 92 and work our way through uh, the presentations. Um, and then we'll actually come back to Bill 92. There's a couple booked in later on. And with that, uh, Ledge TV will uh, bring in our first presenter, uh, Mr. Jason McLean from the NSGEU.
Mr. McLean, uh, welcome. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, you're presenting on bill number 92. Uh, you'll have uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for Q&A. Uh, I'll give you a notification warning at the uh, 10 minute mark, uh, five minutes left. And with that, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you to the chair and committee members. I'm here today to speak on Bill 92, Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. My name is Jason McLean and I'm president of NSGEU. The NSGEU is the largest union in the province representing over 31,000 hardworking women and men across the public sector in the provincial government, corrections, public schools, community colleges, universities, municipalities, commu and community organizations and healthcare. If passed, the continuing care assistance registry will require all continuing care assistance CCAs in Nova Scotia to register with the Department of Health and Wellness every year. CCAs will have to submit an application to the registry providing their name, current employer st employment status, their employer information and their personal address and contact information on an annual basis. The government feels that this legislation will assist recruitment and retention of CCAs. Creating a mandatory registry was one component of recommendation five on how to improve the performance and optimization of the 2018 panel on long-term care. The panel cited that it, the need for more registry to address the lack of data and to identify where the needs exist in the system. A similar recommendation came out to the Health Association of Nova Scotia 2014 report rising to the challenge, responding to the increasing demands in home care, where it was recommended that the Department of Health and Wellness improve data on the supply of CCAs by creating a mandatory registry. Of all the possible steps that could have been taken to address the growing need for CCAs in Nova Scotia, Bill 92 was the smallest one and is woefully inadequate. There are major issues that need to be addressed to solve the issues around recruitment and retention, namely wages and working conditions. A registry will not fix these. Due to, due to almost constant staffing shortages, CCAs are working massive overtime hours and have little access to vacation or overtime or time off when needed. If employees are having a tough time attracting and retaining CCAs, creating a registry, registry will not fix this problem. Um, the minister claimed in a global interview that wages are based on contracts between the unions and employers. But those employers are funded by government. They are the ones that have the ability to increase wages, benefits, and to attract people not only to come to the sector, but stay in it. I expect you will hear from many people at this committee that long-term care facilities and home care agencies throughout this province are underfunded by government. This chronic underfunding leaves them without the capacity to provide adequate wages in a stable standard work schedule. The registry proposed in Bill 92 does nothing to help employers or CCAs on the front lines with these issues. I'm not here to, today to say that the NSGU is against this bill, but I have a number of questions about the scope and intent of this registry. For example, can we have assurances that it will not be used as a punitive tool? If so, remove the fines for not registering. Will the registry function as a mechanism to ensure all current CCAs have a chance to be brought up to a standard of training? Will it increase the economic well-being of the frontline professionals across the province? How long does government plan to collect the data on this sector before finally acting on it? Nova Scotia is currently sitting on plenty of recommendations from several studies into continuing care over the past decade. I would urge the minister the department and the members of this committee to investigate these existing recommendations rather than waste any more time on studying the problem. The solution is simple. Although clearly unpalatable to government, they need to offer better wages and benefits to attract and retain workers to this sector. Let's use this first, albeit small step to move forward to a meaningful solution for the good of all Nova Scotians who require the assistance a CCA provides and all of these hardworking professionals. I thank you all for this opportunity to speak to you on Bill 92. And if you have a digital copy of my statement, you will have some links uh, for further reading. Let's work together for meaningful solutions for continuing care sector. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. McLean. I'll open the floor to questions. And uh, to my colleagues, you can just uh, flag with your hand up on the screen. Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, well, thanks, Mr. McLean, for your presentation. It's nice to see you here virtually. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if you can um, elaborate. If if uh, if it was your choice <laughs> to have legislation tabled in this session uh, about you know what would be the, the 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 way forward for CCAs and to help that sector and and those workers, what legislation would you have liked to have seen tabled in this session? Well, um, one thing that I look at when, when you're talking about the evolution of different sectors within this province is uh, professional bodies that have been implemented to, to not only uh, track it and uh, see what issues are there, but also to bring forward implementation, or sorry, bring forward uh, thoughts uh, and uh, recommendations on how government should move forward with this. So there hasn't been, the Department of Health and Wellness has been doing a, a, a good job with the agencies that we have out there in the long-term care facilities in working with them. But obviously that is broken and this is a step that government has taken towards it. But what we need is actually a body to look at professionalizing this actual sector. So CCAs have been dealing with more a higher acuity level uh, today than they've ever had before in the history. And we've seen actually duties passed on from RNs to LPNs to CCAs. And so when you're dealing with this sector, um, they are doing a lot of work, but there's not enough people staying in it. So I look at uh, things that government has put forward, such as um, um, bursaries and things of that nature, but everybody's going into this field and they don't want to stay in this field because it's not actually what they learned in school because it's just so intense when they get out there and it's so understaffed that people are they're going off to other places such as you know Tim Hortons or or other places that I think have almost comparable um, pay scales and some have uh, perhaps more benefits, but steady hours for them to go into. So when you have people that are working split shifts daily and you have people that are that are working um, six and seven days a week, then what I will be looking at is a bill to one, regulate their hours and not only that, attract people by giving a, a steady pay along with uh, regulation of hours. That is truly what's needed in this sector. I believe uh, Mr. Lohr uh, had this question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. McLean, for your presentation. I'm just wondering uh, how many CCAs do does the NSGEU represent right now? Maybe you don't have that information. Maybe that's the point of the registry. But I'm just wondering <laughs> how many do you represent now? Well, we do have uh, what we call membership records at NSGEU. We're just over 700 CCAs uh, across the province. And Ms. LeBlanc. I just one more question, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. McLean, uh, when you talk about wages, um, what range of wages would you like to see CCAs making in this province? Well, and that isn't necessarily for, for me to say. Uh, as the minister said, uh, perhaps that's a negotiation. I, I don't necessarily uh, agree with that. I, I think a standard could be set by one studying the other provinces that are near us and, and across Canada. I mean, we've already established through the healthcare sector that uh, most professions uh, should be at least leading in Atlantic Canada and um, middle of the pack when it comes to the rest of Canada. So uh, what we're saying is what they're getting paid today is not enough uh, because people aren't staying there. This is this is um, this is anecdotal from from um, decision or sorry uh, conversations that I've had with uh, the Department of Health and Wellness where um, the department actually concedes that they can't keep anybody here. I think that's why we're looking at this bill. Uh, I'm just simply saying this bill is only going to track people and then it's punitive on them if they if they decide not to register. What if somebody was to um, not register on that yearly at that year end or the beginning of the year and uh, because they got out of the field and then they go and they register somewhere else? Well, they'll probably be levied with a fine and then have to go back 
and uh, get that reversed or whatever, right? But when it comes to wages, I, I do think that a review could be done on what is out there across Canada. Then we can uh, actually uh, get in get into a little bit of science at looking at the duties that are there and try and scale them to see what they should actually be paid. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> we certainly value the work that continuing care assistants do. And I agree with you completely. You're seeing uh, downloading of, of care um, take each you know level taking on more responsibility and not the pay the wage is not necessarily reflecting that um, I'm just curious your opinion on uh, I have two questions one is do you think uh, considering the workload and the responsibilities that continuing care assistants are taking on do you think they should become a self-regulated profession similar to lpns and rns and nps and um the second question i have is what are you hearing is the number one concern with with continuing care assistance and retention of them well, uh, the, the second one, uh, I don't know if I can give you one answer, uh, but I, I will say uh, we wouldn't be against a regulating body. I think um, the use of CCAs has uh, grown so much that uh, there should be, uh, I'm not against uh, having a regular, regulatory body, I will say that. Uh, I'm fearful of a regulatory body because of the wages that our members make. Uh, that if they're going to have to pay for the creation of this, then that could hurt them as well. So uh, these are things that need to be looked at at the same time. Now, when, when you talk about uh, what are the, the main issue that everybody is, I'll, I'll just try and keep it uh, simple uh, and give you more than one answer, obviously. <laughs> um, workload um, and quality of life, like work-life balance, they don't have that. So uh, not only that, uh, a lot of times they're on their own in the field when you're talking about um, home care, but also in long-term care, uh, you're looking at um, a lot of residents to very few people. So people are coming into this field, they're taking the bursaries, they're getting the training, everybody wants to get the education, but once they're into the application of it in the field, it is not what they're taught and people are leaving. And I think government does know this, but uh, at the end of the day, we need to do something that's bold to attract people. And, and I know in the past, that is when you, when you look at why people won't stay in a sector, you have to look at what the remuneration is for it. So people aren't getting paid enough and the, and the benefits aren't there either. And you need more people. So how are you going to attract them? I think you have to pay them. Ms. Smith-McCrossan. Thank you for that. And I, I appreciate all of your comments. I think we've seen, you know, a few months ago when, when there was the bonus, the health care provider bonus, I know I heard from a lot of continuing care assistants that really felt unappreciated because they were not uh, initially recognized and paid out that bonus. So um, we do need to do more to... Um, support our continuing care assistance both professionally and uh, make sure that they feel appreciated um, for the work that they do. So thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Minister DeLorean. Yeah, I believe that's uh, it for questions uh, that we have here, uh, Mr. McLean. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Minister, could I leave you with a comment? Sure, minute 20 left. All right. Um, I just want to thank you all for having me here. Um, this group of people, I, I just need to say, uh, they're dedicated to their work. The people that are still in the field, uh, being CCAs, be it long-term care, home care, or even uh, acute care, uh, they're under a different, uh, a different classification. 
Um, they love the work that they're doing and they continue to do this work even though the system is in a crisis. I just hope this committee can just go back, look at this and say, you know what, we need to look at incentivizing people to get into this field because nobody's looking to get rich that's in this field and nobody is getting rich, that's for sure. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak and I, I certainly hope uh, more people that come behind me echo what I shared with you today. Thanks very much. Have a great day, Mr. McLean. Take care, everyone. So uh, we're prepared for our next uh, presenter, Ms. Nan McFadgen, uh, president of QP uh, Nova Scotia. Hello, good morning, uh, Ms. McFadgen um, with uh, QP Nova Scotia President. Uh, welcome to Law Amendments Committee. We're currently speaking about Bill 92, uh, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. Uh, you'll have 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes to present. Uh, if you're still presenting at the 10-minute uh, mark, I'll give you uh, the warning that there's five minutes remaining for Q&A. With that, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. So good morning. As stated, my name is Nan McFadgen. I'm the president of QP Nova Scotia Division, representing, look at that timing, 19,000 public sector workers. I appreciate this opportunity to speak today about Bill 92, an act to establish a registry for continuing care assistance. Our thoughts on this bill would no doubt not be surprising. While we recognize the value of workforce planning, we believe this legislation leaves too much to regulations. If there are specific pieces of information being contemplated for collection, we see no reason why those cannot be specified in the act. What else is being contemplated for collection? If this answer is not known, then the bill is not ready. We have specific concerns about who can access the information in the registry. Will I or anyone be able to search a name only? Or will I have access to a full names of full list of names of CCAs in Nova Scotia? The College of Nurses, of which I am a registrant, and as a result have a familiarity, only allows a name search, of course. They are a college with standards, not what is contemplated here, which is essentially a database. A database which can create a situation where a CCA will not be able to work and have no appeal process. A database will, will not have the oversight of a professional body, or maybe there will be oversight. The act mentions an administrator. We believe this person should be an employee of the Department of Health and Wellness. The Department of Health and Wellness should also have oversight of this very private information, not an outside source. There is also no language in the act that speaks to securing and storage of our data. Only people that register for this database can call themselves CCAs. If there is a conflict, who does the CCA reach out to for a resolve? Tech support? Has anyone here had an experience with tech support? Imagine that experience with your profession on the line. This legislation doesn't speak to fees. However, our read is that the governor and council has the ability to assign fees. Once again, left to regulations. The act says the registry will contain name, registration number, compliant, non-compliant status, and such information as may be prescribed by the regulations. We do not see adding new categories of surveillance through regulations as a path we can support. Even the language compliant versus non-compliant, the word compliant is defined as obeys rules. Even this status implies guilt of some sort. Why registered versus not registered wouldn't be the language is beyond me. You see the theme here. Now, if, there were, if these were different times, we might assign some faith for those regulations to be contemplated in the best interest of all Nova Scotians, and that would include CCAs, the worker. The relationship with this government and unions was in fact chewed up and spit out by this current government. And as a result, faith is in short supply. 
Your anti-worker stance in the multiple pieces of legislation was supported unanimously. So we know where you stand, and that's not in the best interest of workers. We have no faith that you will contemplate the worker in your regulations. You will do what you want, and once again, the worker will be the casualty. Faith is a beautiful thing when it's mixed with mutual respect. That is not something that has interested this government for the past eight years. And so it's not where we are. I realized that this government, the only one in Canada, decided not to access our democracy for the last year, and as a result, has a lot of catching up to do. We do not see that as a reason not to do the work right, even if it's piled up on your desks. We want to see what you are doing in the legislation in black and white. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, open the floor to questions with 10 minutes remaining uh, to my colleagues on the floor. <laughs> Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. McFadgen, for being here today. Um, I guess uh, I heard a lot of things, and I, <laughs> I would love just to talk about everything that you've just said, but <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if you see a path for this piece of legislation at all. Like, is there a way for it to, to be uh, a positive piece of legislation for CCAs in the province with, with amendments, uh, or is there just no need for it, and we should just be moving on and looking at other things? I think we need a way to calculate uh, workforce data. I think we need a way to manage CCAs uh, and the fact that we're graduating them, but they're not staying in the work. I don't think I would disagree with the government. I think we know why they're not staying. Uh, that part is not confusing to me. It's backbreaking work. Uh, they're often mandated to work overtime. Uh, they're underpaid. Uh, they often can't access vacation. So if I applied that to any one of your jobs and cut your pay in half, I feel like many of you wouldn't be sitting where you are uh, because backbreaking labor that pays poorly, <clears throat> um, you, you know, it's not hard to understand why people are not staying. So uh, having said that, I understand that we need to know, we have to know how many CCAs th there are, how many are staying, where they're going, why they're leaving. We need to know those things, but I don't see this legislation, which leaves much, as I said, to regulation as the path forward. There's a lack of trust. Uh, when, they, when, this, uh, re when a registry was first brought out, uh, for CCAs. There was a lack of trust then. There's been nothing done to repair that. So um, the only thing that's different about this legislation is that it's punitive, right? You can't work if you don't sign up. There's a $50 fine if you don't sign up. Uh, and who knows what else will be there if you don't sign up. So it's concerning. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for that answer. I'm, I just had a, a mind blank, so I have to just take a second. <laughs> um, hey, Ms. Uh, look, I, actually, Ms. LeBlanc, Ms. smith McCrossan okay. uh, had a question as well. Do you want to just uh, defer to her and you can come back to you? Great. Ms. smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for presenting today. Sure. Certainly, uh, I agree with uh, many of the words that you've shared and our continuing care assistants do provide incredible uh, service to the people of this province. And we do need to find ways to heal the fractured relationship. <clears throat> and we need, do need to find a way to ensure they feel appreciated and, and an important integral part of the healthcare team. Uh, you focused a lot on, on this and the lack of faith and I'm, I'm wondering if you could share with us specifically any specifics on how you see a path moving forward to repair this lack of trust and uh, ways that we can build a stronger relationship with our continuing care assistants. Hmm. Well, we didn't break the trust, so it makes it more difficult uh, for us to see the way back. And it's all the same players. So I would be surprised 
pleasantly surprised, <laughs> but I would be surprised if I were to talk to all the players involved in that and have them say, oh yeah, we've had a total change of faith. We actually do have a deep and abiding respect for workers and those nine pieces of legislation. Well, I don't know, that was like a dream and we're over it. Uh, but I, I don't think that's where we are. I think, uh, I don't think they'd speak front facing that way, but I think it's how they feel because you know, how you act, what is it that saying uh, people, when people tell you who they are, you should believe them. I think that's how it goes. So I don't see the path back to restoring trust. I think it's there. It's a hundred percent there, but I haven't, uh, it's not our job to rebuild a trust. We didn't break. Um, We've reached out to government. We're going to be scheduling meetings. We'll do the work all the while we've done the work, right? It's up to the uh, government if they're interested in doing the work. And that that proof will be in the pudding, right? The things they say to us, um, if they in fact turn out to be true, I guess that's a little step to rebuilding trust. And each time they uh, speak the truth to us, then the trust will come a little more. I guess that would be how that would roll. Yeah, good luck to us. Ms. LeBlanc, followed by uh, Mr. Law. Thanks, I remembered what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> Ms. McFadgen, um, when I asked the minister about this bill and this uh, proposal in the health estimates dr during budget debate, uh, I didn't really get a clear answer on the on the on the process uh, through which the bill went for to make sure it it would abide by privacy laws and that kind of thing. So uh, I asked if it if it had been taken to the office of the privacy commissioner. Then we went back and forth on that for a little while about how we don't actually have a privacy commissioner and it's all semantics and blah blah blah. But anyway, my point is I don't think that the bill has been seen by anyone outside of the department in terms of a, like to analyze uh, it for. Um, for privacy uh, issues. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that. And I'm also wondering if um, in, in, the, in the presentation of the bill, there was mention of consultation with unions. So could you speak a little bit about if you were consulted or if QB was consulted about it and if, and if the privacy issue was brought up then? Yes, so I guess that kind of goes back to Ms. McCrossan's comment about the ability to rebuild trust. I'm gonna kill this cat. So, um, it, uh, so we were told actually that it went through the privacy commissioner. Uh, we weren't told that it didn't go through the, that we don't have one. So I guess that's another nail in the coffin of trust. Um, so the consultations, yes, we were consulted and that was a year ago. We met with, um, look, the terminology is blanking, uh, you know, government staff, <laughs> um, and did have consultation, and that was a year ago. And then we got word, so so we, there was this idea, and then we met, and we exchanged thoughts on ideas, and then crickets, because, you know, hashtag democracy was on pause. And so during that time, we heard nothing, and then it was like whammy, the bill's gonna be tabled. And so, so it was like, Here's the, here's the information, we, uh, here's what we said. And then there was no further conversation about, um, yeah, we heard what you said and we agree. We heard what you said and we disagree. Uh, you know, any, any, any of that kind of thing. Lordy, lordy. Any of that kind of thing where you would say, Sue, this is a great idea, but I see this change. And then you would come back and say, well, I don't see the change but I agree with you on this piece. So there was no follow-up. There was just the consultation last year and the tabling of the bill, uh, you know, when democracy returned to Nova Scotia. Yeah. Mr. Lohr. With uh, about uh, two and a half minutes. You're on mute, Mr. Lohr. My apologies. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Fanjan. Um, just in terms, thank you for your presentation. In terms of what you've said, I mean, we understand that there's been a desire, a need for this registry for a long time. You raised some very specific issues with this bill, lack of uh, data security, 
punitive side of the bill, too much left undone in regulations. Are, are you saying that we should vote against this bill as it is, or does the need for this registry supersede the problems or fix the problems? I'm just wondering where, where you would be on that. Uh, if I was sitting in your shoes and, and had a vote, I wouldn't support it as it is. Uh, because I can also see that um, the worker is a Nova Scotian, and I would see it as my responsibility to represent Nova Scotians who are also workers. Uh, so I don't see that this does anything to think or contemplate uh, the CCA and their data and what's going to be done with it, who's going to be doing it, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I wouldn't be comfortable with it. Yeah. Maybe if I was sitting in your shoes, I'd feel differently because uh, I would be the person in power and I know how that changes things. But sitting here, that those are my thoughts. Yeah. Ms. smith Crossan with about 50 seconds left. Okay. My question is, uh, if you can advise us exactly what amendments you would like to see, and if you don't have time to share that today, if you wanted to email that information to us, um, that would be helpful. Sure. Who's us? Uh, well, me, for starters. Because, <laughs> I mean, we've consulted with uh, government, so they know our thoughts. Uh, but, yeah, I'll email you. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. McFadden, for your uh, presentation and uh, feedback uh, response to questions today. Have Thanks. a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. To the members of the committee and Ledge TV, we're now moving on to bill number 97, the Electricity Act. And our first presenter for that bill is Mr. Nicholas Gall with the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. Welcome, Mr. Gall. It's uh, to Law Amendments Committee. Uh, we have uh, Bill Number 97, the Electricity Act, is up for discussion right now. You'll have 15 minutes total, 10 minutes to present, and then uh, five for Q&A. If you're still presenting at the 10-minute mark, I will uh, interrupt uh, to let you know that there's only five minutes remaining. Great. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Audio is great. Excellent. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present today on behalf of the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. Um, our association is the voice for wind energy, solar energy, and energy storage solutions across Canada, uh, with many members active in Nova Scotia. Kenria strongly supports these amendments to Chapter 25 of the Electricity Act. So today I'd like to offer some specific comments on the three uh, major provisions of this legislation on behalf of our association and our Nova Scotia member companies. Number one, enabling the governor and council to make regulations respecting any aspect of the program. At present, Nova Scotia is unique, relatively unique among Canadian provinces in that the specific terms and conditions of net metering are each defined in legislation as opposed to in regulation. So there is strong precedent for uh, what this act proposes in terms of allowing the governor and council to make regulations respecting any aspect of the province's net metering program, as would result from the, this amendment. So this amendment effectively would introduce to Nova Scotia the same legal framework that currently governs net metering in Alberta, New Brunswick, and Ontario. In British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador, and the territories, Retail rates for customers who generate their own renewable electricity are offered by the provincial or territorial crown utilities pursuant to government policy directives with oversight from the relevant provincial territorial authorities. Prince Edward Island is actually the only other jurisdiction in Canada that defines specific net metering terms and conditions in legislation as Nova Scotia currently does. So this act is uh, well supported by existing precedent in that respect. Uh, secondly, removing certain requirements with respect to a program that permits customers to generate renewable low-impact electricity for the customer's own use. 
So prior to the Nova Scotia Electricity Plan Implementation Act 2015, the maximum nameplate capacity, so essentially the size of a net metering installation in Nova Scotia, stood at 1,000 kilowatts or one megawatt. Uh, the Act of 2015 reduced this limit to 100 kilowatts. So for context, uh, a big box grocery store, Atlantic Superstore or similar, uh, would have enough roof space for perhaps 10 times as much solar PV as is currently allowed with the 100 kilowatt limit. And an apartment building or condominium development would have space for 200 kilowatts or more quite easily. Uh, so the current cap is highly constraining for multi-unit residential developments, particularly those that are targeting net zero, um, which is a designation meaning uh, an energy efficiency of the home is such that it produces as much energy from solar as it can consume. Um, so a number of leading energy efficient home builders are based in Nova Scotia, and their customers are increasingly demanding these high performance homes as they seek to reduce their carbon footprints. Enabling these types of sustainable residential developments to move forward with larger rooftop solar installations will help to drive significant investment in this home building sector, where, as I said, Nova Scotia is, is emerging as a leader. The current cap also has a significant impact on the commercial, industrial, and institutional sectors, essentially rendering on-site solar generation uneconomic for these large consumers. In Ontario, there is no generator capacity limit for net metering customers, uh, provided that the generation equipment is quote-unquote primarily for the customer's own use. In Alberta, there's a five megawatt capacity limit or 50 times Nova Scotia's current limit with the stipulation that maximum generator output cannot exceed total annual energy consumption at the customer's uh, site or aggregated sites. So you essentially, you can't produce more electricity than you would consume in a year. Lifting the 100 kilowatt net metering cap would enable many more farmers, manufacturers, large retail stores, and other critically important job creators to more effectively manage both their energy costs and carbon emissions for decades to come, while helping to create hundreds of good paying jobs for solar installers across Nova Scotia. Thirdly, allowing for the development of programs that will permit a customer, a group of customers, or a third party to generate renewable low impact electricity for a customer's or group of customers own use. Um, so this is often described as virtual net metering. And the virtual net metering model enables a group of electricity customers to generate their own electricity at an off-site location. And it's very well established. Um, this type of arrangement does not yet exist in Canada, but there are approximately 25 US states, I think, that do have uh, similar arrangements in place. And this amendment would enable Nova Scotia to lead the country in establishing a, establishing a first of its kind, truly inclusive and equitable net metering framework. So the advantage of virtual net metering is that it offers customers of all types and sizes a way to lower their electricity bill without um, an upfront cost in having to install a solar system on their home, building, or property. So for example, it would enable many low-income families that, for example, might rent an apartment and not have suitable roof space, or a business owner um, who doesn't own the roof of their store or restaurant or similar, um, to subscribe subscribe, uh, quote unquote, to a solar virtual net metering project located nearby, such as on a large uh, building rooftop nearby or a vacant lot or, or somewhere else in their neighborhood. The customers see the benefit on their electricity bill and the solar generating system can be installed where it makes the most sense, both for the grid operator and for the local community. So we recommend that the committee move forward with approving the bill as proposed so that stakeholder consultation can move forward on lifting the net metering cap and developing a made in Nova Scotia virtual net metering policy. And thank you for your time. I'm very happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, with about 8.45, I open it to questions and Ms. Chender is up first. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, and those uh, elements you spoke of are um, really helpful in understanding how this would be operationalized. Um, as with a lot of the legislation we've been talking about, 
that sort of signals something great, but without the details, we, we don't know how it will work. Uh, do you have any sense? I mean, I understand your recommendation to pass the bill and move into consultations. Our concern is the length of time that those consultations might take. Do you have any sense that it would make sense to include the virtual net metering and lifting that cap and some of the other things you're talking about in the legislation itself? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I would recommend um, the specific wording just sort of offhand. I mean, we haven't had a chance to, um, to really develop with the stakeholders we've been talking to what sort of an alternative might look like. So mm -hmm. I think the consultation is is going to be extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean I think the way the way this is proceeding, I think will will enable that consultation to take place within a reasonable time frame. But I'm not prepared to recommend what what could specifically be added to the legislation today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other questions from the committee members. So with that, I, oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Lohr, just under the wire, about seven minutes remaining. Mr. You're on mute, Mr. Lohr, sorry. Sorry, my apologies. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gall, for your presentation. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just trying to understand, and and, uh, and maybe you can tell me how does this affect? Uh, and I know, um, I mean, Nova Scotia Power. I'm not speaking on on their behalf. I'm not advocating for them, but I just have a question about if if I was sitting in Nova Scotia Power's seat, I would think uh, I'm providing backup power for everybody's solar grid. You know, when the sun's not shining, so to speak. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any comments, how does this impact Nova Scotia Power and uh, how, how you see the grid functioning? I just, just want to ask that question. No, it's, it's a great question. I think you're absolutely right to raise it. Um, the, so Nova Scotia has committed to a very ambitious um, renewable energy target. I believe 40% renewable energy by 2022 now. It's been delayed two years. Um, and to net zero. Um, so, so the province already has quite a significant volume of wind, for example, and relatively small amounts of solar. So those, those two generation sources are actually quite complementary in terms of when they generate. Um, so as the province moves forward with um, implementing more wind generation, which typically produces most um, at, at nighttime and in the winter, um, in early spring, fall, uh, when solar is, is less and relatively little during, let's say, like a summer's day when solar is producing at its peak, um, there's actually a lot of potential for, uh, for the two to, to balance each other quite well. I would also point to the fact that the province is moving forward quite quickly with um, incentives for electric vehicles, for example, uh, as well as on-site battery storage. Um, and as these technologies move forward, there's going to be, I think, less sort of need for the grid to serve as, as the balancing mechanism for, uh, for the solar and more opportunity for, for the premises themselves through electric vehicle charging or through a battery or, or similar um, to actually manage their solar generation themselves. So I think uh, your, your question is correct, but um, I think as, as we move forward with, with more sort of technological advancement in this area and more renewable ener energy deployment in general, um, I think it'll, it'll work out quite well, actually. Okay. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our presenter. Um, I'm curious, given your position uh, with the Canadian Renewable Energy Association, um, where do you see opportunities here in Nova Scotia for new entrepreneurs and existing entrepreneurs? And I, I will make mention, I'm always, I always like to uh, share some of our strengths here in Cumberland. We have, of course, Surrette Battery, Rolls Battery that yes. produce um, batteries used all over the world for storage of both wind and solar energy. And uh, I'm wondering what opportunities you see for entrepreneurs here in Nova Scotia. 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that's a very well-deserved shout out to Surat, to proud Kenria members. Um, and uh, I, I think there are plenty of opportunities. So I think currently there are around 60 uh, companies that have signed up for the Efficiency Nova Scotia Solar Homes Program. Um, and, uh, and those are electricians, contractors, uh, good paying jobs in the skilled trades uh, that have been enabled by this program. And as the market for renewable energy continues to grow, uh, as we hope it will through expansion of the net metering framework, as I've discussed, as well as through, for example, the Green Choice Program, um, I think there's going to be uh, a profusion of, of new opportunities in renewable energy in the province. And um, I think what the government has has done quite crucially is is set forward a very clear trajectory of of, of targets and and where they want to be, um, and that gives in industry the signal it needs to invest and and really move forward. I think Nova Scotians also tend to uh, really prioritize um, climate action and. Uh, and I think that's also a very, very important signal for companies looking to invest in the province in, in these technologies. Ms. smith McCrossin with about two minutes remaining. Thank you very much. And I'm wondering if you had an opportunity to advise us how we could make this legislation uh, even better so that it could do open up even more opportunities, uh, what would you, how would you advise us? Um, I'm, I'm not actually prepared to answer that right now um but that it's it's a very good question i think what really is important from our perspective is um the fact that this legislation uh will open up an opportunity to consult on a detailed regulatory framework um, where we can work with stakeholders across the province business owners um it, rural communities urban communities first nations um, and uh, and really find a, a framework that works for everybody. Um, but I think the, the consultation aspect is, is really key. Um, and as I said, there's, there's plenty of precedent for, uh, for having um, a relatively, frankly, kind of vague um, uh, legislative framework for a much more detailed regulatory framework um, in terms of a net metering policy. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gall. Um, I believe that's it for questions. Appreciate your time and you. uh, information you shared with us today. Thank you. Next uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Peter Polly from Polly Corp Properties Incorporated. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Polly. Uh, it's Law Amendments Committee. Uh, we're currently speaking to Bill Number 97, the Electricity Act. Uh, you'll have 15 minutes total, 10 minutes to present, uh, five minutes for Q&A. Uh, if you're still presenting at the 10-minute mark, I'll uh, interrupt to let you know that there are only five minutes remaining. Okay. Can you hear me? Hear you great. So okay. you can, uh, feel free to. Okay, thank you, Minister Delory. Um, I had submitted a presentation. Um, I'm wondering if it can be brought up onto the screen. Actually, I don't believe it uh, can uh, through uh, the law amendments uh, process. Uh, I don't uh, have uh, access to do that. Uh, virtual this is the first time working through. Okay. Um, so we'll just have to go with the verbal presentation, I believe. Sure. Um, do, you, do you all have copies of the presentation? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, I just need to uh, change my screen around so that I can uh, bring it up myself. Um, so just as an introduction, so do you have it in front of you? It's a solar power for apartment building. I do. Thanks. Oh, okay. I'm not sure about my colleagues, but. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Um, so my name is Peter Polly. I'm uh, with a business called Polycorp, which is a business that we started in the Halifax area about 30 years ago. Uh, we uh, 
Uh, we've done a bunch of different different things over time: land development, house development, um, building houses, uh, street infrastructure, municipal infrastructure, apartment uh, construction, and uh, condominium construction. Uh, but just to diverge from that for a second, I uh, would just like to tell you uh, why I feel so strongly about this uh, about this area. So if you look at uh, slide number two, um, this is uh, this is my daughter Katie, and uh, this photo is about uh, ten years old now. This was 2011, and uh, we were uh, were fortunate enough through my business that we're able to accumulate a fairly significant number of. Uh, travel points and miles. So we travel quite a bit as a family. So this is us in 2011, actually in uh, in Hawaii. So then you flip, flip to slide number three. Uh, this is uh, Katie at our hotel. And if you look at the book, she's actually reading a book called uh, Turtle, uh, Turtle Rescue, um, because at that point, she, uh, she loved turtles. Uh, photo number four, is a uh, photo that I took uh, while swimming with Katie and turtles in uh, in Hawaii. Fabulous, fabulous experience. Slide number five is uh, Katie uh, swimming beside a turtle. In Hawaii, you're not allowed to uh, you're not allowed to touch them, but uh, you can find them and actually swim with them. So this this day. And can you still see this uh, this slide, Minister Delory? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so on this day, this was a bit of a uh, um, call it a a life changing experience for me. So this is me and my daughter Katie, who loves turtles, swimming with turtles. A beautiful day. And she, uh, at one point, when we're in the water, she turns to me and she says, Dad, you know, you're, you're so lucky. And I'm thinking, I'm lucky, you know, we're both lucky to be here. So I say, well, why do you say that? And she said, well, I'm 10, you're 40, you're 30 years older than me. 30 years from now, they're predicting that because of uh, global warming, that there aren't going to be any turtles. The turtles are all going to be extinct because uh, raising temperatures uh, allow the ocean water to absorb more carbon dioxide and the ocean is becoming more acidic. The turtle shells are breaking down. Um, so she said it's widely predicted that 30 years from now, the turtles will be extinct. Well. I nearly started crying there, and I get emotional every time that I uh, I tell people this uh, this so, this story, and I'm getting a bit emotional here now. And uh, you know, keeping in mind, I'm uh, I'm in the real estate development business, which most people would acknowledge is a uh, it's a fairly uh, fairly tough uh, business, and it's not for the uh, it's not for the uh, for the soft of heart. Um, so maybe if you could just skip over to uh, slide number seven. So just to give you a bit more backdrop on us, um, we've done some projects in the Halifax area that uh, many of you would probably be familiar with. Uh, north end of Halifax, Mont Blanc Terrace, um, it's almost 300 uh, units there, townhouses and multi-unit residential uh, buildings that we still have as rentals. Uh, Slide number eight, uh, we built the Spice Condominiums building, the corner of uh, Barrington and, uh, and Cornwallis, uh, won a couple of uh, uh, international awards for that one. We also won a couple of international awards for the uh, Mont Blanc project. Uh, slide number nine, uh, 76 unit development in uh, Spryfield called uh, Ravenscraig, uh, all super energy efficient homes. Slide number 10, the uh, Kulofs building in the north end of Halifax uh, it was the uh, largest uh, lead platinum multi-unit residential building built in Canada in 2018. Um, so th this is the sort of stuff that we're uh, that we're doing. Uh, slide 11. 
We currently have a, uh, a very large project underway in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, in Min Minister Irving's riding. Slide 12. This is a drone shot of our uh, Wolfville project. Slide 13, just another perspective. And if you look at that photo, you'll see our, our buildings in the foreground and those green uh, green unused fields in the, uh, in the background on the other side of Main Street. Uh, slide 14, just another view of our project with the uh, vacant lands around a new building under construction in the uh, in the foreground. Slide 15, uh, building that we currently have under construction there. So this would be, uh, this is a 72 unit affordable housing project that we're building in conjunction with Housing Nova Scotia. It is registered in the uh, CMAC uh, co-investment fund. It would be one of the probably two or three projects at most that would be involved with the uh, CMAC co-investment fund in the in the province. Slide 16, uh, just to give you a relative feel for uh, what we would like to do. Uh, we can make this building net zero today. The buildings we're building, uh, there's a definition called net zero ready, which is scheduled to be in the uh, National Building Code in 2035. We've been building buildings at that energy performance level for about 10 years now. So we're tracking roughly 25 years ahead of the, uh, ahead of the building code. So this building uh, on uh, slides 16 and 17, this shows a, uh, about a 400 kilowatt uh, solar panel array system. Uh, that number of panels on that building will let us operate it um, on an annualized business, on an annualized basis to produce as much electricity as we consume to make it, uh, to make it net zero. Slide 18, uh, we've gone through the, uh, the uh, project there. Um, so this is one of the other buildings. This is a, uh, a 200 kilowatt system that would provide about half of our annualized electrical needs. Uh, this number of panels would let us cover all of the heating, cooling, and potable hot water for the, uh, for the project. Uh, slide 19, just to put it in uh, in perspective a little bit a uh, little bit more. So, slide 20 shows what we would uh, like to do in a perfect world is to be able to do a solar farm, um, because when you're looking at putting panels on roofs, there are other considerations. You know, water waterproofing the panels will last longer than the shingles and just some other logistical uh, uh, issues. But the, the problem today is that we, it's very, very, very difficult to do any of this under the current net metering uh, regulations and the act because the 100 kilowatt limit is imposed on a per customer basis and I have been advised that uh, some would say that Nova Scotia Power would have the ability to actually transcend legal entities to apply that to basically any corporation that we would be involved in in, in, in any way. So that's that's a, that would be a legal ar legal argument. Um, Mr. But Mr. Polly, I just uh, interrupt him quickly just to let you know that you're at the 10 minute mark, five minutes okay. remaining. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we would applaud the efforts in the current revisions to the act to allow us to be able to, uh, uh, to undertake projects like this. Uh, slide 20, um, area at Long Lake is a large project that we have underway in the Spryfield area of Halifax. Uh, slide 22 is a rendering of the, uh, of the project Slide 23, uh, that is a photo from, uh, from Saturday. So the project is well underway. Slide 24, that is a uh, 200 kilowatt solar array on top, of the, uh, on top of the building that we have designed. Slide 25, just another perspective. 
slide 26. It's a two towers in the building. So we would envision doing a two 200 kilowatt uh, arrays. Slide 27, there's another project, another property that we have right next door that we can do another 200 kilowatts on. Uh, slide 28, uh, we have a large piece of land in Heron called Cove that we called uh, Daybreak. Uh, slide 29 is an example of what we would like to do. This would check the boxes for what everybody says is the right way to do development. It would be a dense, walkable, transit-connected community. And with the changes to the Electricity Act that we are discussing, uh, it would be able for us to achieve a net zero um, on, on a project by being able to incorporate solar into the, uh, into the project, either on the rooftops or similar to the uh, photo there on, uh, on page uh, on in slide 30. Uh, so I have been personally lobbying everybody that I can for the past 10 years to try to get these changes made. I think it's fabulous that we're taking this step forward. Um, to me, a lot of this isn't about just the hardcore economics. Some of it is we're just trying to do the right thing so that we can make the world uh, a bit better place for, uh, for our kids uh, 30 years from now when, uh, when they have kids. Uh, there is one nuance that I would ask be considered. I made another submission this morning because I'm concerned that there's a bit of a conflict. Uh, some municipalities land use bylaws uh, won't specifically allow solar panel arrays like I've shown on these uh, on on these uh, photos and I would request um, that it be clarified in the Electricity Act that it would uh, override municipal uh, land use bylaws. I did check with uh, HRM and there is a provision in the act that privatized Nova Scotia power that specifically allows anything that's dealing with electrical distribution, that it doesn't need to follow the land use bylaws, but that was written 30 years ago before fields of solar panels like this was contemplated. So this would be a fairly simple add-on to, uh, to, uh, to grow on the basis that's in the uh, Nova Scotia Power Privatization Act, just to clarify that if a person has a piece of land in Harrods Field or Kings County or wherever, that they're allowed to allowed to do this. Uh, I don't think any municipality would stand in the way to object this to this, but it will take them ten or fifteen years for everybody to change their municipal planning strategies when the province could uh, could do it with a couple of sentences in this uh, in this act that's uh, that's underway now. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Polly. Uh, about uh, forty seconds remaining. Uh I think it was a pretty comprehensive presentation. I don't see any questions from my colleagues. So uh, with that, I uh, just want to thank you, Mr. Pauly, for taking the time to, to join us and uh, share uh, the details uh, with us uh, with respect to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. So we've reached uh, the time for our 15-minute uh, break. Uh, we should be back at uh, 1021.
Mr. Chair, is it? Uh, still on bill number 97, the Electricity Act, uh, Mr. Sean Kelly from the Clean Foundation. Good morning, Mr. Kelly. Welcome to Law Amendments. Uh, we're currently discussing Bill Number 97, the Electricity Act. Uh, you'll have uh, 15 minutes total, uh, 10 minutes for presentation, five for Q&A. If you're still presenting at uh, 10 minutes, I will uh, interrupt just to advise you that there's five minutes remaining. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. You can hear me okay? Just fine. All right. Well, thanks very much for this opportunity to speak about uh, the amendments to the Ele uh, Electricity Act. As you said, my name is Sean Kelly. I'm director of uh, energy programs at the Clean Foundation, which is a nonprofit um, environmental organization that started in 1988. Uh, many of you may know us as Clean Nova Scotia, and we're the largest environmental NGO in the Atlantic region. Among our many programs uh, that are those that address energy efficiency, but also clean energy promotion, reduction of energy poverty and energy insecurity, and partnerships with uh, First Nations communities in Mi'kmaq. We also administer something called clean energy financing, which is a property assessed clean energy or PACE program. And it's currently operating in seven municipalities in Nova Scotia. Uh, we're also supporting six other rural municipalities uh, through a clean climate municipal action project. Um, I wanted to speak to you today uh, to voice our strong support for the uh, changes to the Electricity Act, specifically support for a shared ownership solar program using a subscription or virtual uh, net metering approach, and also uh, encourage higher caps on how much solar can be produced by individual buildings in the province. We believe that um, these improvements to the Electricity Act can have both environmental and social equity benefits. And I'd like to quickly touch on, on two areas. One is the nonprofit sector and the other is clean energy partnerships with, with Mi'kmaq First Nations. So as you probably know, Nova Scotia has over 6,000 nonprofit organizations and they contribute uh, around $1.7 billion to the GDP annually. They operate in hundreds of rural communities and in urban communities. There's over 20,000 uh, staff, full and part-time employees. Um, and it's also a sector supported by 74 million volunteer hours every year. And that has another economic uh, benefit of about 1.5 billion. So, Many nonprofits, uh, and it's a very important sector, but many nonprofits do in fact own their own buildings. But as you know, a lot of Nova Scotia's building stock is old. It's in need of substantial upgrades if we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these nonprofits are facing rising uh, energy and heating costs. Uh, an opportunity to produce solar power to offset their electricity bills in part or completely is definitely good for the environment and it could be good for the bottom line of nonprofits, meaning more money uh, can go to actual programming. Switching to electric uh, heating, especially as our grid gets greener, uh, and then being able to offset this with solar PV will decrease our collective reliance on uh, fusil, uh, fossil fuels. I would like to encourage the government to consider a few other things to support the nonprofit uh, profit sector, specifically a nonprofit sector clean energy building uh, fund of some kind. Because while solar is a critical opportunity, nonprofits also need one, the funds to complete the energy efficiency and enabling upgrade, upgrades to make their buildings efficient and optimized for solar energy. They often lack the resources that would allow uh, for significant uh, investment in their physical buildings, their physical space. Uh, most nonprofit uh, funding is tied to specific program outcomes, leaving little in the way of expendable capital to invest in greening their buildings. 
And there are some funding streams out there that uh, nonprofits can tap into, but often they have a very high matching fund ratio. Uh, You have to come up with 50% to get 50%, and that can make it a a non-starter for a lot of nonprofits. And then second, we believe that nonprofits could benefit from some type of clean energy coaching system. Although they are experts in their specific areas of operation, few nonprofits deal in building management, in renovations, and even fewer have uh, the time or capacity to dedicate to what can be uh, a fairly complicated process of doing energy efficiency, clean energy production, coordinating and managing uh, trade contractors. So I do believe that they will need a non-biased, neutral um, uh, coach of some kind that they can trust. We feel that support for nonprofits through enhanced solar energy programs and other clean energy measures uh, will definitely reduce energy costs for them, free up funds for their critical work. But it will also allow nonprofits who are not directly involved in environmental issues feel that they are now actively contributing to climate change solutions. We feel that climate change is not in the cultural domain of uh, the environment movement or any one sector, but it's something that um, all sectors have to feel that they have a role in. Just quickly turning to First Nations Energy Partnerships. We at the Clean Foundation, we've been very fortunate to work with a number of nations on energy efficiency and energy education projects. Uh, We were also very fortunate to have the support of the Nova Scotia Department of Energy and Mines to complete a study on the viability of community solar projects across Mi'kmaq nations in uh, Nova Scotia, Mi'kma'ki. The report was done in collaboration with Mi'kmaq consultants, and we looked at Indigenous energy projects across the country. We also engaged with local Mi'kmaq communities, Nova Scotia Power, and the Department of Energy of Mines. So it's really interesting. There's been a lot of Indigenous involvement in renewable energy projects in Nova Scotia and across the country. Uh, The success of these projects has usually been driven by a collaborative relationship based on mutual respect uh, between individual communities, utilities, financial institutions, private sector companies and all levels of government. Um, The continued enthusiasm of First Nations uh, in renewable, um, future renewable energy projects within our province will certainly require that financial benefits from these projects uh, remain in those communities and that Indigenous peoples have equitable access to jobs, training and education. We believe that a solar, shared solar model could be Uh, a very powerful way to advance community level energy independence and self-determination in the spirit of reconciliation. Solar projects in Nova Scotia that involve First Nation communities must of course be developed in their specific cultural, political and economic contexts. Uh, To date, um, collective models of ownership on First Nations have not always uh, been conducive to some forms of community solar facility ownership and benefit distribution because the current caps in Nova Scotia on electricity exported from net metered uh, solar facilities can be a barrier. And current policies have placed disproportionate reduction uh, restrictions in this context due to First Nation models of communal ownership. Um, The costs with developing behind the meter solutions to to the current caps and policies have been very cost prohibitive. They require additional storage and power management distribution systems. We believe that allowances will be required that provide Mi'kmaq communities with um, greater agency in developing larger scale generation facilities and novel methods to distribute benefits to community members. Such uh, arrangements may uh, extend beyond the confines of individual Mi'kmaq communities and the distribution zones are in and allow intercommunal solar infrastructure to help satisfy the electricity demand of nations throughout Nova Scotia. As you know, some nations are, are a lot smaller than others, some are quite large. They may want to share their uh, solar resources and solar production. And while a First Nations band as an entity may benefit from a net metered solar generation facility, currently these benefits uh, cannot be easily shared with band members who pay for their own electricity. 
there is also limited opportunity for band members who live um, outside of those communities and other distribution zones. Uh, commercial interests of the band um, may be in other distribution zones, and they may want to attract non-members to participate in their solar projects. So that's why we at Clean and certainly uh, the, the partners we've talked to were quite heartened that the province is going to explore virtual map metering that would allow for the sharing of electricity credits with fewer restrictions. Um, we also think that Mi'kmaq nations could in fact serve as pilots in some way um, as we implement and try out uh, virtual map metering in Nova Scotia. Through the study that we did, um, we found that there was very strong support from community representatives regarding the sharing of investment and benefits for renewable energy projects. Um, and this is an appetite for these types of projects that's been uh, demonstrated already through initiatives uh, such as those led by the Bobasan Mi'kmaq Wind Management uh, Company. But of course, it's Mr. It's first. Uh, yeah. Mr. Kelly, just letting you know about uh, five minutes remaining. Okay, I'm almost finished. So um, I just wanted to say that it, really it's First Nations, of course, that will have to uh, directly offer their ideas and perspectives to you. Uh, we just want to share some of the things that we learned through this uh, community solar uh, garden study that we did. And it's it's a study that we're happy to share with you. So I'll, I'll just conclude there uh, and say that we are very supportive of the proposed amendments. Uh, we think they're important steps uh, on a longer journey to dramatically reduce GHG emissions and garner the involvement of a wider range of organizations and communities in climate action. Nova Scotia is very fortunate that we have a, a, a deep history of energy efficiency and um, projects of that nature, uh, now adding that strong greenhouse gas reduction lens to programs across uh, the province is going to be uh, very, very important. And we do think that the amendments to the, the act could be one important step. So I'll end it there. And I just want to again, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly, for your presentation. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, first question, Ms. Lisa Robert. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, there, there will still be work to to do uh, with these amendments uh, in developing regulations, uh, and that will include consultation on regulations. I wonder if you'd have any thoughts on what a, a justice and equity centered consultation process uh, could or should look like in terms of who should be at the table and and other other uh, considerations certainly yeah it's it's an excellent question thank you um certainly in in the consultations with first nations uh they're gonna have to address unique context the fact that the nation in one part of the province may want to collaborate with others and to allow that flexibility. I think getting the nonprofit sector more involved, perhaps reaching out to the community sector council or groups like that to really get nonprofits who aren't involved in quote unquote the environment to feel that they are actually now part of it. And I also think from a social equity lens, this is a bit of a generational uh, moment, both for the environment, but also to ensure that underrepresented, historically underrepresented groups are, are truly um, getting into the industry. We're going to need energy auditors, contractors, people that can do the complicated work of developing climate action and GHG uh, work and action plans. And we have to make sure that underrepresented groups are involved. Uh, so we're going to need training, uh, possibly. We're going to need uh, support for that because um, this is a long-term project and we don't want to miss that opportunity. Uh, I will say that uh, the, the social equity lens, there's also the capacity lens. In Nova Scotia, we need more uh, contractors who understand whole home uh, GHG and um, reduction analysis. We need more energy auditors. We are going to need a lot more capacity to achieve all these wonderful targets. Thank you. About a minute 40 remaining. Not seeing any other questions. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Kelly, I want to thank you again for your presentation and uh, answer to uh, the questions. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. 
Our next presenter is Mr. Bruce McCulloch, the owner of MCC Energy Strategies. Welcome, sir. Uh, we're to law amendments. Uh, currently discussing bill number 97, the Electricity Act. Uh, you'll have uh, 15 minutes uh, total, 10 minutes to present, and five minutes for Q&A. If you're still presenting at the 10-minute mark, I will uh, interrupt briefly just to let you know that there's only five minutes remaining. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm not sure whether or not I can have the uh, opportunity to present a PowerPoint presentation. Is that uh, possible? The, the content has been uh, distributed to the members, um, but uh, we're fairly new with the um, virtual, so we haven't been uh, loading them. Okay, so it, it would be, uh, um, yeah, there's a couple of places in the slides where it would uh, sort of, they, they move forward with uh, the text, but, um, I'll uh, I will move it onto my other screen, and I will uh, sort of use it as my guide as I go forward. So, uh, so thank you for the opportunity. My name is Bruce McCulloch. I'm an independent consultant with uh, my own company, MCC Energy Strategies. I uh, have on my first slide just the three things that uh, I want to emphasize. Uh, I mean, first of all, just Congratulations for moving forward with this amendment. Um, the uh, the existing act has been a, an impediment, impediment for me for three situations. One is on some townhouse style condo corporations uh, with respect to uh, one in Bedford and one in Chester um, because of the 100 kilowatt limit. Community solar farms, I've been involved in a contract and uh, co-op that uh, was interested in forming in Western Nova Scotia, two separate entities there. and. Uh, so this will allow us to move forward with those possibilities. And I'm currently got a contract for a municipal water treatment facility, and we were looking at doing certain things behind the, uh, the meter. And this will allow us more flexibility, more flexibility of options. So, so that's um, just from a business point of view and from an opportunity point of view for the uh, um, community at, at large, and I mean the Nova Scotia community, this is a tremendous improvement to uh, allow us to have that uh, flexibility of going beyond the 100 kilowatt cap and the uh, and the ability to have corporations such as condo corporations um, be uh, in, involved in some, some of these projects. Um, I did go on, and, and if you've got the slide presentation, it just went to you half an hour ago. So it may be that you have it in front of you. But I did go on to talk about the climate emergency that we have, um, and um, just taking the opportunity to point out that I mean, two years ago in 2019, we were at 408 uh, for the CO2 emissions, last, and then 420. And is what had happened last week. So this is uh, continuing to uh, be a, a big issue and we need to continue to have um, movement in this direction. So I'm uh, pleased that we're moving ahead with the amendments to the Electricity Act, but uh, we need to continue to have uh, some, some uh, radical fast moving changes in this regard. And um, that's why I, put in some of those images in, in the presentation of the wildfires in behind uh, some golfers in California. I mean, they're just, um, they're going about their regular golf game and, and yet the wildfires are blazing behind them. Um, there's another image of a, uh, a farm uh, homestead, it looks like, that has uh, got a dike around it trying to keep the waters out. And uh, um, so, I mean, without the images in front, it, it's hard to, um, speak specifically to them, but um, there's some quotes there from Mark Carney that talk about how 
Uh, climate issues uh, need to be part of every professional financial decision. And we're now in this presentation trying to uh, have folks understand that it's uh, got to be part of every political decision, every decision that we make as a, as a community. Um, and um, so we've got many engineers and others, uh, such as Sean Kelly, who just finished, who are keen to move forward, but we need your political help to do it. And, and again, I congratulate you on this um, change to the Electricity Act. Uh, and, uh, and I also want to move to my next slide, which is that we need ra radical efficiency, radical uh, simplicity, but at the bottom is it's a radical community and that involves a communication strategy that uh, uh, needs to go out to the province to convince those that are maybe not quite as aware of, of the crisis that we, uh, that we really face. Um, we've got a um, hundred of the world's largest companies committing to be a hundred percent renewable, but um, it's it's not just renewable that we need that change in, in thinking. And um, when I go about energy efficiency audits and this sort of thing, I uh, look at elimination of waste, energy efficiency measures, energy conversion from fossil fuels, and then finally we look at renewable energy. And that's uh, part of what uh, I want to highlight is that the renewable energy is uh, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, so, um, you know, we've got all parties, fortunately, in this province being uh, on board with this. Uh, the Progressive Conservatives started uh, a certain initiative in 2007 with the Environment Goals and Sustainability Act. Uh, the New Democrats uh, continued to do the good work, and now the Liberals are doing good work. So I, I think there's a chance here to, to really show the country how parties can work together to do some of the uh, the good work that uh, that we've been doing over the years in, in Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, yeah, so then I put together a couple of specific ideas. One that I would love to see is a, a moratorium on new building construction until developers agree to a, a zero carbon approach. Um, we've got uh, 12 key developers in HRM and they uh, do 70% of the development and it wouldn't be that hard to get them together and say, look, um, let's do what Peter Pauly does so well. Look to the leading edge, look to triple glazed windows, extra insulation, advanced uh, heating systems in every uh, uh, building that he puts together and um, not be satisfied with just the minimum of the, uh, of the building code. And there's a couple of other ideas there. Um, I want to highlight the slide that uh, I put in there about Nova Scotia Power. I mean, in 2019, they announced that they finally achieved 30% renewables. But if you go on the website today, their home page, they'll indicate that here to date, they've only done 28% renewables. So it's a tough nut, but they, uh, and they're working in the right direction, but and solar will help. But you'll note that solar is still not even mentioned there it's uh, less than one percent of our energy and uh, we've got better solar energy potential than germany and they get 77 percent of their energy from solar so um then uh second to last slide talks about how uh, we've got solar storage coming in play storage is gradually becoming more and more cost effective and it will be more and more part of the solution so um and my last image is just to, you know, keep those primary slides in your mind as uh, as we go forward. So, um, yeah, that's that's it for presentation. I mean, really, in terms of this particular Electricity Act, uh, it's summarized in the first slide. I had some opportunities that have been difficult because of the existing act, and I congratulate you and uh, your colleagues for uh, for making this uh, this change. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. McCulloch. Uh, now uh, open up to questions. Ms. Roberts, uh, with about six and a half minutes remaining. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Um, 
I think all parties are proud of, of um, our legacy in terms of uh, supporting the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act um, in 2007 and then moving some of those initiatives forward. I wonder from where you sit, kind of what what ranking would you give in terms of, uh, you know, if, I, if there was... Uh, a hundred percent would be like the maximum possible um, action and implementation given the the climate uh, emergency that we're in. You know what what percentage of that uh, potential for reducing greenhouse gas emission, uh, 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 achieving reduction in emissions? What percentage of of our potential are we currently realizing in Nova Scotia? Oh. Um. maybe 50 percent i mean i I'm, I'm just guessing but it's it's there's so many areas um energy poverty we have buildings all over the place with inefficient uh, walls and and so on this is the residential sector we've got um new buildings that are going up that don't uh, look to leading edge technologies. And so they're, uh, they're used, you know, the, the, the cycle is such that you put more insulation in place, you put better windows in place, you need a smaller heating system and cooling system because you've now been able to reduce what you, you need from that extra insulation and so on. And so you need less energy. And, and we continue to build buildings that uh, are just to the minimum building code, and and that I, I, every time I see a skyscraper, I wonder have they have they done the the leading edge type of uh, thing? And and I, I know the answer. I I mean, there's a building on the on the Bedford Highway that they're uh, the travelers, uh, which is being torn apart, and they're doing in some ways the right thing because they're leaving as much there as as they can rather than doing what they did with the Roy building, which is just tear it down. So all that concrete disappeared with all the energy that went into that concrete. And then they built another building full of concrete. And uh, that sort of thing frustrates me. So I, I mean, it's, it's multifaceted. And, and the space that I live in is very much buildings and more than uh, renewable energy, although I end up um, being involved in some renewable energy projects as well. And uh, so uh, there's there's so much more that can be done. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I say 50% because we need to get to zero and, and we're gonna be at 50% once Muskrat falls and, uh, and some of these uh, solar projects go forward, but uh, we, we need to, to finish it, finish the job. All right, I'm not seeing any other, uh, oh, uh, Ms. LeBlanc uh, has a question. It's about three minutes for me. Yeah, sorry, Mr. McCullough, thank you so much for your presentation. And I didn't get it until you were finished it, but I just flipped through the <laughs> pictures now. And that one with the golf course is just unbelievable. Um, but um, I mean, this is a, maybe a conversation for another day, but sh shouldn't we not be taking the minimum standards of the building code and making them the making them like the the strict strict uh standards that we need with the triple glass and all the extra insulation so so the minimum building code doesn't ask for triple pane windows right but shouldn't so, we change that yeah exactly and yeah. and there is move afoot i mean the department of energy and mines is, is doing some things to develop um the the uh take us to the next level, um, which is in BC and, and others, they've, they've got a whole program called the BC STEP program that, mm -hmm. that's taking that further. So, um, but we need to have an, an carrot and stick incentives and, and, and um, non permissions. So I would, I would suggest that our, our developers, again, I'm pointing out there's 12 key developers in town and uh, we need to get them on board and say, look, um, stop with the granite countertops focus and, you know, look at the energy and, and think in terms of life cycle of the whole building. And now you'll actually get a less expensive to operate building 
which might cost a little bit more, surprisingly not that much more if, if you do it right with a little bit of extra design up front. So, so that's, uh, I'm glad you picked up on that, uh, Ms. LeBone, because that's uh, one of the key elements that I want us to, to think of is that we want to um, have all this new building that's going to be around for 50 to 100 years to have um, the absolute utmost in energy efficiency. And uh, so the zero carbon uh, standard of the Canadian Green Building Council would be a better approach than the minimum building code, which is, is a minimum. And, uh, and I mean, we can be proud in, in, in Nova Scotia that we always take the latest building standard. But the latest building standard is now 2017. Some of the other provinces are choose to adopt the 2011 or the 2015 building standard because it's a it's a building standard done by the federal the, the federal government, but it's up to the provinces as to which one and which year they choose to adopt. Um, so I'm saying that even the latest, which is 2017, is not good enough. And we need to go beyond that um, as soon as possible. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. McCulloch. Um, I believe there's a, that's pretty much time. I appreciate your presentation and uh, time to answer the uh, questions that came forward from the committee. Have a great afternoon. I very much appreciate the opportunity to present. And, and again, congratulations on moving forward with this. And um, I uh, look forward to seeing the regulations and what, uh, what we can do in, in the years to come. Great. All the best. Just before we move on to the next presenter, just a, a quick uh, note uh, for colleagues. Uh, I believe just uh, unlike when we're in person, I think uh, our, our members uh, are supposed to just have our videos on when we're officially at the table. And I think uh, the uh, NDP caucus has, uh, there we go. Um, again, you can be joined in, but just to, to have your video on when you are uh, the official uh, member to be counted. So thank you for that. Uh, next up is Mr. Robbie Douglas, the Natural Forces Solar Inc. Welcome, Mr. Douglas, uh, to the Law Amendments uh, Committee. Uh, we're currently uh, speaking to Bill Number 97, the Electricity Act. You'll have uh, 15 minutes uh, total, 10 minutes to present, five minutes for Q&A. If you're still presenting at the 10 minute mark, I will uh, interrupt you briefly just to let you know there's only five minutes remaining. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, uh, Randy, Susan, Gordon, everybody else here. I'm sure there's quite a few. Uh, my name is Roby Douglas. I'm the Vice President of Operations here at Natural Forces Solar. Um, do you mind turning on the screen sharing? That we we're fairly new. We haven't uh, really been going with uh, presentations. Anything that's been submitted, okay. uh, we've we've received from committee, and we have our, our local copies. Understood. Um, so I'll start off with an introduction: who we are. So Natural Forces Solar. We're a local, uh, privately owned company here, headquartered here in Halifax. Um, we're a team of about 15 uh, primarily engineers and project management professionals. Um, so we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Natural Forces, which is an independent power producer that's been around for about 20 years now, active in Atlantic Canada, uh, developing large scale renewable energy projects. So our team's a little newer. Um, we started work in 2017 developing smaller scale solar energy projects for communities. Um, we've developed and installed a cumulative uh, over one megawatt of community solar systems to date, really been spurred by the Department of Energy's Solar Electricity for Community Buildings program. Um, that program has really unlocked the potential for larger scale uh, community solar systems that have allowed uh, community groups, First Nations, municipalities to invest in the clean energy transition. Um, we really see there, there being two important uh, changes here to the Electricity Act that will be pivotal in unlocking additional clean energy investments in Nova Scotia by Nova Scotians. So the two matters that we're here to discuss this morning are increasing the net metering cap and the introduction of shared solar or virtual net metering. Uh, I'll start with the net metering cap. 
I'm sure a number of you are familiar with uh, the IKEA building over in Burnside. Um, when it was built, it has the largest solar energy installation in, in Nova Scotia on the roof there. Um, unfortunately, with solar systems that are greater than 100 kilowatts, uh, anytime you're producing more electricity than you need, you need to shut down parts of your system so that you're not basically spilling any power onto the grid. What this means is that we're actively wasting renewable energy right now. There's projects such as IKEA and many more to follow that will be forced to reduce their output, reduce those green electrons hitting the grid at a time when we're in the middle of a climate crisis and every green electron we can get is helping our fight against climate change and reducing our GHG emissions. So increasing that cap is really important, not just for the installations that have already, uh, have already gone forward, but for other ones that are coming down the pipeline so that we don't need to waste these green electrons. Furthermore, obviously wasting electricity, probably not the most economical solution either. Um, so this will allow us to unlock more larger scale installations. And these installations are really important, um, not only just for the people that own them, but for uh, the entire community around them. So when we put these solar panels on the roofs of IKEA and schools and hospitals, we're really generating electricity at the site that the electricity is needed. So that reduces transmission and distribution infrastructure upgrades, and those costs are shared across all rate pairs. So citing the generation where the load is, is really a value to everybody in Nova Scotia, not just the people that are installing the systems or owning and, and operating the systems. It's their neighbors as well that are gonna share in the value that's created there. Not only that, but these systems employ uh, large numbers of people uh, putting up thousands of solar panels is, is, is a lot of work and not only during construction, but on the front end designing. As I mentioned, we have a team of about 15 engineers and project managers here. Uh, we also hire out for our various uh, specialized consultants across Nova Scotia. We've got great consultants in electrical engineering, geotechnical engineering, structural engineering. All of these people are critical to making these projects happen. So it's really a team collaborative effort using Nova Scotian expertise to get these projects off the ground and, and Nova Scotian construction experience to deliver these projects and really start to kick off the clean energy transition here on the solar side. The second thing I wanted to talk about was virtual net metering. So this is something that I think is really important for Nova Scotia, and it's a great opportunity for us to be a leader nationally. So a virtual net metering program will allow Nova Scotians of all walks of life to invest in the clean energy transition. So right now, if you don't own a home or you're renting or you're in a house that doesn't have a great roof for solar, you're kind of stuck. You have to buy power from the grid and you don't have any other options. If you want to be a part of the clean energy transition, you're being left at the side of the road, so to speak. So a subscription-based model such as been proposed here would make green energy affordable and accessible for renters, lower income individuals and, and, and homeowners who didn't think when they purchased their house that, that solar energy was gonna be something that was in their future. So an uptick in these projects would drive growth across local renewable energy industry in the ways I just discussed with increasing the net metering cap. Um, these are gonna be large systems. They're gonna employ dozens, if not hundreds of people during construction, as well as all the support services required from the engineering consulting uh, industry and construction management. Um, the final bit with virtual net metering, which I think is, is really interesting, is that in the past, we've seen the uh, CDIF program, the Community uh, Economic Development Infrastructure, uh, to allow Nova Scotians to invest their money directly in these projects. So not only, again, with, with uh, the larger net metering cap, we sort of talked about how it's your neighbors that benefit as well as you, with virtual net metering, we're allowing, uh, or we have the potential to allow Nova Scotians to invest their hard-earned cash into renewable energy projects uh, so we can keep that money within the province and use it to spur the clean energy transition as opposed to looking at alternates. Um, so that's all, all I've got to put forward today. So I'd be happy to take any questions from yourself and any of the other members Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Uh, so with about eight minutes remaining, uh, Ms. Chender has the first question. 
Uh, thanks very much for the presentation um, and for support of moving forward in this way. Um, I wanted to ask, you kind of flagged an issue uh, that we don't talk enough about, I think, which is labor. So this creates a ton of jobs as we kind of shift um, into a greener grid. Uh, but I wonder, as a company who, you know, as you describe, is engaged with that labor force in all aspects, what what does that picture look like to you? Do we do we have everyone we need? Do we need to be training more folks? What are the jobs like? And and what do you see, you know, as we continue this energy transition in that realm? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there are a, a few different uh, sort of specialties that are involved. Uh, I would say to, to answer your first question, yes, we have the people within Nova Scotia to do this work. Um, it's uh, in terms of retasking and, and retooling the workforce. Um, solar electricity installations are um, uh, not not to put a put it lightly in terms of the work that all of us do, but it's uh, it's fairly easy to get people up to speed on this. We have a number of training programs offered by um, NSCC that are sort of on the, the shorter uh, time period to get people that are already experienced construction workers up to that level to start doing solar installations. And then we also have programs such as the uh, Energy Sustainability Engineering Technology Program, more of a two-year diploma for people that are looking to get more involved into the design and the project management side of these projects. Um, but really we're looking at foundation contractors, we're looking at civil contractors, electricians, uh, millwrights, carpenters. We have all of these people here in Nova Scotia. A number of them um, have had projects uh, that have had to have be canceled or at least put on hold due to COVID. And we've had absolutely no issue sourcing um, labor for our projects in, in 2020. And we're not seeing any shortages in, in 2021 either. We're in the position where we're always going out and, and working with local contractors. Um, and we, we haven't had any issues yet. We're not anticipating any. And it's been great to work with so many local contractors. Ms. smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the presentation. I'm curious, you know, you're you're part of a, a larger corporation, and I'm just curious for, uh, of your input today. Legislation, I find, is often just sort of catching up with industry as opposed mm -hmm. to leading and creating opportunities for industry, um, whether it's be energy or, or other sectors. I'm just wondering if you, on behalf of your company, have any advice as legislators of how we could be presenting legislation that's not just catching up with where you're at in industry, but actually be leaders? Hmm. Uh, I think it's all about engagement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our projects are a team effort and this should be no different. Um, I rely on, and my team relies on subject matter experts. Uh, as I said earlier, various consulting firms that we get to do specialized scopes of work. We don't know everything and uh, none of us do. It, it's bringing everybody together and collaborating um, and keeping an open and transparent lines of communication, um, working together to, to achieve our collective goals. All right, <clears throat> seeing no further questions, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Douglas, for your presentation and taking the time to uh, answer our questions today. Thank you, have a good afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. So we are finished with our presenters for Bill 97, the Electricity Act amended. We have one more presenter uh, that is uh, reverting to Bill number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act, and then this is uh, Corey McKinnon. Just take a moment, uh, Corey, you can turn on uh, your microphone and your camera. Uh, 
Okay. Hello, Ms. McKinnon. Uh, welcome to Law Amendments Committee. Um, we're currently discussing Bill Number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. Uh, you'll have 15 minutes total, uh, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for Q&A. If you're still presenting at the 10 minute mark, I will interrupt briefly to let you know that there's only five minutes remaining. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm here to speak on Bill 92, the Continuing Care Registry Act. My name is Corey McKinnon, and I'm an employee relations officer with NSGEU. Currently, I serve as 14 home support locals throughout Nova Scotia. I have the honor of representing over 1,800 home support CCAs from Yarmouth to Sydney, and I have done so for about a decade now. The announcement of this bill has garnered a number of reactions from the home support CCAs that I work with. From, does this mean the government is finally recognizing the valuable work that we do? To, this bill does nothing to help the current crisis in home support. While past ministers have given them little respect, home support workers have always known how vital the work that they do is for the most vulnerable members of their communities. CCAs do this work because they deeply care about the clients that they service. Home support CCAs certainly do not do, do not work in this field because of the pay and working condition because the pay and working conditions are good. Unfortunately, they are not good. This is directly related to an inadequate funding from government. CCAs in home support currently make $19.79 an hour. And in eight of the 14 locals that I service, the majority of the workers there have no set schedule. Many need to be available to their employer from the morning into the evening to try to get eight scheduled hours of work. And there is no guarantee that they will get these hours. These employees never know what their exact paycheck will be, nor what exact hours they will be working weekly. Yet regardless of their low wages and unpredictable schedules, Home support CCAs go out in all weather at all times of the day and evenings to ensure that our loved ones are cared for. The CCA registry is being touted as a tool that will assist in the recruiting and retaining CCAs in many sectors that employ them. From the perspective of home support CCAs, the registry does little to fix the issues in the sector and that are a detriment to hiring and keeping staff and I think the agencies who employ these CCAs would not disagree with this assessment. Do you want to make it easier for agencies to hire? Do you want to make entering the field an attractive option to people? From the perspective, I think the union and agency directors agree that to do it, it is vital to pay these employees better and to offer them a stable working schedule. Government must properly fund wages and make it possible for agencies to guarantee people that they will be scheduled and paid for 40 hours a week. Home support CCAs are a vital part of the healthcare system. This was made even more ev evident during the pandemic. Frankly, home support workers could have opted to take COVID benefits, stay safely home with their families, and would have fared off similarly financially rather than taking their normal wage. But their commitment to their clients would not allow them to do so. So I come here today, not to totally reject the idea of the registry, but to ask that the registry be that one of the number of initiatives that this government undertakes to ensure that there are CCAs to take care of our loved ones. It is time to take care of our caregivers and I urge government to focus their time and energy in making necessary improvements and increase funding. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Ms. McKinnon, for your presentation. Uh, we have some questions, uh, Ms. LeBlanc first, and the second question, Ms. Smith-McCrossan, I saw your hand go up as well. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. You had mentioned um, that uh, at least with NSGEU uh, workers make $19 an hour, CCAs make $19 an hour, and you outlined the difficulties of you know not knowing a set schedule and not having a set paycheck and I I I understand how difficult that is um, from my my previous work um, but I'm also wondering about non-unionized CCAs because I know that there is a significant wage gap do you can you speak to wages for non-unionized CCAs or what you just sure. even anecdotally 
Yeah, my understanding is that while wages are fairly similar for uh, for um, some of the for-profit agencies that hire certified uh, CCAs, they of course are coming into a situation where they do not have um, the benefits, uh, et cetera, that is offered within a, a unionized uh, employer. Um, and again, for those employees as well, they are not, they're in the same position as some of our unionized employees in regards to the scheduling issues. Um, they do not get paid uh, per, they get paid for um, the clients that they service, but they're not guaranteed a certain schedule or a number of hours per week. So clearly there are issues both in the unionized environment and in a non-unionized environment when it comes to CCAs and home support. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Ms. smith McCrossin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm wondering, first of all, I want to say thank you for representing so many uh, continuing care assistants throughout the province. And thank you for being here today. Uh, certainly the role that they play in our healthcare system is invaluable and we need to do a better job as a government. My question to you today is, would you recommend that we support this piece of legislation and then do uh, other legislative work or do you think that this piece of legislation should not be passed? Um, I guess quite frankly, this is, uh, would not be really putting a dent into any issues that are currently in the, in the field, especially for home support, the CCAs and home support. Um, um, we do see that the for employees, um, they look at it as potentially being a, if they believe that the registry may um, put more value on the positions that they have. And, and their hope is that it would lead to uh, making improvements elsewhere in the sector and making more improvements that impact their lives. So again, as I say, um, I'm not opposed to the registry and I did not speak in opposition to the registry, um, but feel that it, it has to be in combination with the, uh, other things to make improvements in the sector. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. smith McCrossin with a follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that response. I'm wondering if you haven't already, would you be willing to share with myself and anyone else on the committee that's interested um, exactly what recommendations you uh, would make to us in government that you'd like to see? What changes would you like to see? And my second question is, is there... Uh, a desire or do you believe the continuing care assistance would like to become part of a regulated, self-regulated workforce similar to licensed practical nurses and registered nurses and, and NPs where they have more control and uh, accountability, I guess, as well as uh, professional practice and those types of expectations. Can, and I'm asking this question specifically in consideration of the increasing um, scope of practice and responsibility that they're taking on. I think for the most part, our, our CCAs, or, or in particular the CCAs that I work uh, with in home support, are um, not opposed to uh, being part of a registry. Um, they do believe that there perhaps um, that, that there should be some governance over the work that they, they do. Um, but again, it is, if it's being introduced without any um, uh, work being put into uh, to, to deal with the crisis in, that, in not only the, the home support sector, but in a long-term care sector as well, uh, they would see it as little value if it's not in combination with some other things. Certainly from a home support perspective, um, I guess when you look at CCAs in both long-term care, home care, and acute care, uh, our home support members feel like they are kind of at the bottom of the healthcare barrel. And many, much of that has to do with the fact that they don't have, uh, except we do have two um, uh, agencies that we work with that have a guaranteed work scheduled arrangement for their workers, but the majority of them do not. And so if you're, and I, if I'm an employer of, of, of a home support agency, I would, I would be assuming that there, it's going to be particularly difficult to get people in home support, even beyond long-term care and acute care, because you can't even offer as an employer an actual uh, shift of work to uh, employees in home care. And this makes it particularly difficult to hire people. Um, and 
So for our members, that stability of wage is a big thing, of course, but there's also a stability of a working schedule and a guarantee of 40 hours a week that currently in the field is not offered to uh, at all of the agencies that we service. So um, stabilizing um, that workforce, stabilizing the home support workforce is absolutely going to mean uh, bringing it up to the standard of both long-term care and acute care in regards to a scheduling arrangement. Thank you. And uh, Ms. McKinnon, I just note uh, to the question about uh, any further submissions, if you wish, you can just send them to the uh, Ledge Council uh, through the legislature and they make sure that uh, all members of the committee receive uh, if you have supplemental information to share with us. Sure. Nuts. Oh, Ms. LeBlanc. Mr. Chair, I don't have a question for our guest. I have something uh, like I want to put a motion on the table. Okay, we'll just uh, one moment for questions. All right, uh, seeing none, uh, Ms. McKinnon, thank you for your time and your presentation uh, today. And um, we'll uh, continue uh, shortly after this. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc, just uh, to your desire to do a motion, we are reaching our 15 minute uh, break. Uh, would you be okay uh, deferring that to when we return at 11.30? Yes, the only thing is I think that our last guest is, has canceled. They have, so that's why when we come back uh, the 15 minute break now, we'll be back on at 11.30 and we'll begin uh, moving the motions for all of okay. the bills on our agenda today at that time. Great. All right, so we'll see everyone back at 11.30. Okay, just want to check my audio, Ledge TV here, but I'm back again.
we have quorum and most everybody is here. So I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I believe we're finished presentations and we'll now deal with any motions. And I think I don't see Ms. LeBlanc here. Uh, I just will wait for her because I think she does have a motion. So in saying She's that- She's here and has a motion. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Yeah, sorry, I set my alarm for 13 minutes. Did we come back early? <laughs> Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, I would like to move a motion um, that we uh, send Bill 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act, back to the department for further work. Uh, I don't know if I can speak to that or do I have to leave the motion on the floor first? Um, usually we get these motions in the form of a written form, uh, but I wouldn't, I would say seeing that this one is a, a little bit simpler, um, certainly we can deal with that if you want to speak to that now. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the reason I'm, I'm suggesting this is that we've heard a number of concerning um, concerning comments from our guests who spoke on that bill, on Bill 92 today. Uh, at best, we've heard that the bill really does nothing to advance the work and the working situation of CCAs in our province. And at worst, the bill could seriously compromise the privacy of those workers, cost them money, and cause them increased admin work in when they're already working a very stressful uh, job. Um, the representative from CUPE pointed out that because there's so much left to regulation, that in in those in terms of those uh, issues, uh, the fees, the fines, and all of that being left in regulation, we're really not sure what it means for those workers. Uh, but we did hear from everyone who spoke on the bill that CCAs need much more than this bill, and this bill doesn't do anything to help them. Um, you know, they everyone across the board talked about the very low wages that the that the workers in this sector uh, get. Uh, there's no guarantee of hours. There's no sick benefits uh, or not much in, in terms of sick benefits and protections for a very backbreaking, uh, laborious job. And so I feel like um, this bill should go back uh, and the government should consult again with members of the sector, with workers and their unions and with their employers and uh, bring back a, a bill that has teeth that actually uh, is going to um, make retention and recruitment of CCAs actually happen in this province. Thank you. Mr. Oh, Chair, sorry, on. thank you, Mr. Lohr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my understanding that normally uh, any motion would be seconded before it would be spoken to, but so I will second second it and with your permission speak to it. Um, the PC caucus is in favor of the registry and sees that as a part, a necessary part of really addressing, uh, starting to address the CCA uh, issues in the province, which are profound. Um, I do recognize, though, that uh, one of the presenters raised some serious privacy issues uh, with the bill and uh, the um, addressing who will actually be the administrator of the registry. And I think those are important questions. So we, even though we are in favor of the bill, I guess I would be in favor of seeing those uh, issues in particular uh, be addressed. So I would speak in favor of the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lohr. And just for, uh, we don't need a seconder for, okay. for those motions. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, I, I did the same thing myself a few law amendment meetings ago, so not a problem. Um, any other people that would like to speak on this? Okay. So we have a motion on the floor, uh, for bill number 92, the continuing care act Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act to refer the bill back to the department. Uh, all of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is defeated. Um, do we have any other um, uh, of these bills that we have motions on? If not, I'll entertain uh, motions to refer them back to the house. Ms. Diab. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I uh, move to report Bill Number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act, back to the House. 
with no amendments. And Ms. Dieb, I believe for sake of uh, efficiency, you could actually go through all the bills uh, and list them all and we can deal with them because I believe the motion is gonna be the same for all. Is that right, Mr. Hebb? With the consent of the committee. Okay, I, I, no, we'll do, we'll do it right. individually so, then. So why don't we vote on the one that I just moved? Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Yeah. LeBlanc. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think we should vote on them separately because I might have different votes for different votes. <laughs> not, not, not a problem. My apologies. Uh, Ms. Uh, smith McCross, and I assume that your comment might have been the same? My comment is we should be voting on them individually. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dieb, my apologies. Ms. Dieb. So I, I will reiterate, I move to report Bill Number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act, back to the house with no amendments. So the motion on the floor is to refer bill 92, the continuing care assistance registry act back to the house without amendments. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Ms. Dieb. Uh, uh, do we deal with them in, uh, how they were presented or which? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, why don't I deal with bill number 97, the Electricity Act? I move to report bill number 97, the Electricity Act, back to the House with no amendments. So, anybody speaking on this? So, the motion on the floor is to refer bill 97, the Electricity Act, amended back to the House. Without amendments, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Ms. Dia. Sure. So the next one on my list is bill number 84. Sorry, bill number 85, the Securities Act uh, amendment. So I move to report bill number 85 back to the House with no amendments. So the motion is to refer Bill 85, the Securities Act, amended back to the House without amendments. Uh, no speakers. All those in favor, say aye. Contrary, aye. Minded, nay. Motion is carried. Ms. Dieb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move to report Bill number 87, the Pension Benefits Act, back to the House with no amendments. So, so the motion is to refer Bill 87, the Pension Benefits Act, amended back to the House without amendments. No speakers on this. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Very minded nay. Motion is carried. Ms. Dieb. So the, the final one is Bill number 95, the Parenting and Support Act. I move to report Bill number 95 back to the House with no amendments. So the motion is to refer Bill 95, the Parenting and Support Act amended back to the House without amendments. Any speakers on this? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. So that concludes our business today for the law amendments. Thank you everybody for their time and have a good week. Appreciate it. We adjourn.